What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? I'm of the age where I was a bit spoiled in terms of my first um, trips to the cinema, like as I landed squarely in that age range where Star Wars was my first movie and then other big formative films, you know, in, in between the ages of like three and 10 were like Star Wars, Close Encounters, Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, Gremlins, like a lot of the Amblin films or the sort of like Spielberg Lucas films. So I think sort of uh, th those were, I, I pretty much saw like most of the sort of big releases and anything genre related. So I very quickly like lurched towards that. And, um, and that sort of continued in terms of, uh, you know, films that I, and directors that I became obsessed with when I was a, like a preteen, when I was interested in getting into the business, but not really knowing exactly what I wanted to do. But in that period, it would be things that usually like they were illicit for me to see that I was too young to see at the time, American Werewolf in London or The Thing or David Cronenberg's The Fly or Alien or Aliens, but um, I certainly knew everything about them. <laughs> and then when I was got the opportunity to watch them, like, like I was I was never disappointed. But the film that really changed um, what I wanted to do and made me decide to become a director, or rather it was the light bulb moment that said, this is what I have to do, <laughs> was less a film, but a documentary about one. And then I followed that up by trying to see everything that I could. And basically, in 1988, when I was 14, there was a program on Channel 4 in the UK um, presented by the chat show host, Jonathan Ross. He did this program called The Incredibly Strange Film Show. And every week they would spend an hour on a different director. So within like that show, there are only two seasons of it. You'd have an hour on Russ Meyer, an hour on John Waters, an hour on George Romero. Um, an hour on Jackie Chan, but the one that really like made me like really sit up and pay attention in terms of um, this is this is what I'm going to do with my life was he did an hour on Sam Raimi, and within that hour were um, basically not just the story of how Sam Raimi made the first Evil Dead, and then, and subsequently his other films at the time that they made the documentary he'd only made crime wave and evil dead 2 and was about to make dark man but hadn't made it yet either way in this documentary was a sort of breakdown of of how sam raimi came to make the evil dead starting as an 18 year old director i think he started making evil dead in in michigan when he was 18 and finished it when he was 21 so when, it, when the film came out, I think in 1981 at the Cannes Film Festival, Sam Raimi was only 21 years old. So that kind of just blew my mind that this was possible because, you know, growing up, I wasn't really had the access to a lot of film books. You know, I would basically like read whatever was at the school library, which wasn't much, or the public library, which also wasn't much. So you sort of tend to wrongly assume that all directors are sort of um, just born in Hollywood and or you know that, that that's you know people have just directors live in Hollywood and they don't come from around the world or they don't come from kind of um you know backgrounds that are not in film you know I completely incorrectly think that maybe Steven Spielberg has been dropped off by a stalk at Universal Studios not that he was ever an amateur filmmaker I don't know all this information so that was all stuff to be discovered so in a way, the story of Sam Raimi was the first time I'd actually seen like laid out in a TV show that this is a, a teenager who made a movie. And within the documentary, they obviously had tons of clips of the Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, but also of Sam Raimi's Super 8 shorts. Um, and, and at this time, my, my, my parents had just bought for me and my brother as a, a joint birthday and Christmas presents so covering four events had bought us a secondhand Super 8 camera. So we already had it and we had been mostly like the first things that we'd shot me and my brother were just, it had a slow motion function on the Super 8 camera. So we just like shot the destruction of our toys in slow motion. So we were shooting these kind of Sam Peckinpah-esque <laughs> like montages, a bit like the end of Zabriskie Point, but with our teddies and uh, action men being thrown out of the window. 
anyway, I saw the documentary. I saw Sam Raimi's shorts and also clips of a Super 8 version of um, The Evil Dead, which they made called Within the Woods. And that was it. I was like, the next day at school is like, I'm going I'm to do this. We're going to make a movie. <laughs> or it was just like everything was now leading towards doing that. I mean, at this point, I had not seen either of the movies and I couldn't see The Evil Dead because at that point in 1988, The Evil Dead was banned on VHS. There was the early 80s video nasty scandal where the conservative government came down really hard on unrated horror movies that were coming out on VHS. And so I think like over 200 were banned. But I did see Evil Dead 2. And so that was weirdly like the second sort of part of it in terms of what really fired me up was seeing that on VHS. I think I first watched it round my friend, um, Ollie Van Der Viver's house. He was my school friend, he lived around the corner and he had a VCR and I didn't. And he had an older brother who could get uh, films out from the video shop, get an 18 out. So we watched Evil Dead 2. Weirdly enough, Oli van der Viver, who's my school friend who appeared in my first movie, is now like a top art director. Like he's worked on the recent Star Wars movies and he's working on Indiana Jones as we speak. Um, but back then we were just like teenagers um, at a comprehensive, like a state school in Somerset. So anyway, Evil Dead 2 like completely blew my mind. Um, and I just was sort of dazzled by the invention of it. I, I just, uh, I couldn't understand how you could pack that much, um, you know, just that much uh, like sort of m movie magic. I mean, I know it's like a horror film, but it's just like an incredibly creative movie. And I think it's one of those interesting movies where because Sam Raimi, his interim film Crime Wave, which was written by the Coen brothers was like a flop, he had sort of, gone back to the Evil Dead franchise and probably approached it with a really go for broke attitude. Like if you just had a flop film, then you're really trying your hardest on the next one. So Evil Dead 2 is just like an absolute riot of ideas. Um, a few years later, I finally saw Evil Dead 1 because they re-released it on VHS in the cut form. But this is when I was at art college. I went to art college for two years and there was a guy in the nearby university who had an uncut version of Evil Dead, which was like a ninth generation VHS. So one of the ways I learned how to edit, and I've told Sam Raimi this story, <laughs> one of the ways I learned how to edit is I, I had my version of Evil Dead, which had been bought from the shop. And I had a ninth generation uncut version. And I went into like, the editing suite, probably illicitly, to be honest, late at night at the college when nobody else was there and tried to cut the two films together. So I had a better version of the whole film, but I spliced back in all the things that the censors had cut out. So this is one of the ways I learned how to edit. Um, anyway, it, it's still like something to this day where I watch it, um, a film like that, and I just think it, it's such a, an amazing, um, it's an amazing lesson of just like, I don't know whether if you kind of like you're making your first films that you're somehow un, you, you're not restrained by um, knowing what does and doesn't work. The thing that I find amazing in those two films by Sam Raimi is he just kind of like approaches everything with such abandon. And I think it's that weird thing as you get older, you start to kind of like have more reasons why not to do things. And so there's something about the kind of the, the the energy of like sort of a young director like that who's sort of like diving headlong into everything not knowing whether it's going to work or not and it's just i find it so inspiring and every time i watch it i have the same sort of thrill about it the second one which is only 82 minutes long and packs more kind of ideas into it and more types of gags both kind of horror gags and you know comedic gags than like the last like 20 studio horror movies I saw. So it's a film that still continues to inspire me. And I finally got a chance to, uh, well, I've met Sam Raimi a number of times over the years. I met him after Shaun of the Dead and he was very nice about my movie and we had lunch. He always seemed like he was, whenever I would try and bring up what he meant to me, Sam is very modest and sort of isn't somebody who kind of, you know, sort of likes to, you know, get kind of um, lavished with praise. But uh, 
more recently, I got to moderate a Q and A at the Egyptian in Los Angeles for Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, and I um, I got to tell Sam in front of an audience what he meant to me, and the fact that I wouldn't really be doing what I do in the same way without him. So I was very happy to do that. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? There's a number of films that like sort of like that. inspired me in a way that I like wanted to do what they did but didn't know how and then sometimes there were films that I felt like shamed me in terms of like what am I doing so you know another film that had equal kind of um, uh, influence on me to the Evil Dead films was uh, the Coen Brothers Raising Arizona which I saw probably when I was 15 on VHS and I just could not stop watching it because I it's that thing when you you enjoy a movie and you're just kind of completely wowed by it and then a certain obsession takes over where you just want to watch it over and over and over again just to figure out how it works and as I started to make films you know I spent two years in art college doing a national diploma and I I couldn't get into the film course that I wanted so by this point I'd been making amateur films and they were all in the sort of vein of like the Zucker Abraham Zuckers or Mel Brooks or even like early Woody Allen sort of um you know, the kind of early funny ones, as they say. Um, But very much in that kind of like Looney Tunes, kind of like go for broke, lots of like silly gags, sight gags. And I was making like a lot of spoofs when I was a teenager. And this continued through art college. I made like a superhero spoof and like a cop spoof. Um, The cop spoof is called Dead Right and actually is on the Blu-ray of Hot Fuzz. Um, And then I made a Western spoof, like a sort of a, a 60 minute like Western on video eight if you remember that format um then like when i was 20 i made uh i made um a feature version of it on 16 mil we got a a local businessman in a similar way to evil dead actually a local businessman invested in me making a film and gave us like eleven thousand pounds which we shot for like 21 days on with like a cast of like school friends and people from college from my art college that I just left. And and then I moved to London to edit the movie. And so I'd made this thing and I remember like one, my film tutor in um, Bournemouth Art College where I went, Pete Stanfield, he said to me when he heard I was doing this Western spoof, he said, don't make a Western spoof as your first movie. He goes, you don't wanna, you don't wanna do like a spoof as your first movie. And uh, I, at the time I thought, oh, you know, no, it's fun, I'd be good, but like, there was something (laughs) he was right of course in the sense of by the time I got to London and I was editing it I was very like aware that I'd committed something to film that was very silly and that maybe was this the best kind of debut and I started to kind of look at it in comparison to like other debuts that I really loved and not like Citizen Kane or Sex Lies of Videotape more like El Mariachi or The Evil Dead or um you know Peter Jackson's bad taste um either way so i was so when i was editing in london i moved to london me and the editor from my college were editing in a broom cupboard um in pinewood we weren't actually sp- supposed to be there <laughs> we were there like again illicitly just editing this movie which was kind of like a 74 minute piece of silliness and then around this time um pulp fiction had just come out at the cinema and obviously like everybody in the film business, not that I was in the business, but all of the sort of film fans were just talking about Pulp Fiction endlessly. And, you know, I started to feel like what I'd made was very goofy and very small and kind of like insubstantial. And then like, it took a year for like um, us to sort of get the money to finish the movie and do the post-production. And it, it came out at one cinema, the Prince Charles in November, 1995. I remember very quickly after that. So I'd made this goofy little movie and, you know, it got me an agent and some people liked it and it got some good reviews, but it got some terrible ones as well. Um, but around that time, Train Spotting came out. <laughs> and then Train Spotting, the like Pulp Fiction was an American film. So that was easier to kind of like, um, <laughs> like deal with. But like Train Spotting was such a sort of like bomb going off in terms of a British film that was like so incredible and so incendiary and so brilliantly made that I felt, even though I was only 20 years old at this point, 
maybe I was 21 by this point actually. But when Train Spotting came out, it just made me feel very small. And then my like silly little Western, like really didn't seem like it kind of like amounted to anything in the wake of something as amazing as like Train Spotting. So those are the films that make you feel humble. And then like you also, always in your career, there are times when you see films that are so good that it makes you want to get out and work like i went into tv after that but i really wanted to make another movie and whilst i was making the tv show space i saw whilst on holiday in los angeles i saw run lola run the tom twyker movie and that just like set my brain going again about oh my god what an incredible movie i've got to make a feature film i got to make another feature film so i'd see these movies that would just make me jealous run lola run was one and then later, other times, it's like, usually it's more that I get inspired by movies that just make me want to go back to work. When I was editing Shaun of the Dead, I saw the premiere of Kill Bill and I loved it. But also I, I, I was in work so early the next day because it's like, oh my God, like film, what an amazing business we're in. Like, well, look at what we can do. And I was just like, just inspired by things. I get inspired by, you know, when people you know or people you don't make movies that you just think, oh, and like I felt that about Alfonso Cuaron's Gravity. I felt that watching George Miller's Mad Max Fury Road. There's just things where you watch people make next level stuff and it inspires you. You know, obviously if there's an element of jealousy to that, it's probably a good thing because it just kind of like forces you to work harder. Um, but I, I, I always I always think back to kind of feeling extremely humbled by train spotting and the, the film that I'd made was couldn't even come within 5,000 miles of it. Whether it was your own work or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you belonged? When uh, me and Simon Pegg made Shaun of the Dead, um, when we finished the movie, I suggested to Universal that we should reach out to George Romero to watch the movie. Because I felt we had made the movie as a tribute to him and we didn't see Shaun of the Dead as a spoof. We, sh we saw Shaun of the Dead as a, as a comedy that existed within George Romero's universe. So in a way, whenever people use the word spoof, we'd sort of bristle at it because we felt, well, really, this is like a Valentine card and it's a Valentine card to George Romero. So before the movie came out, I suggested, and this is like a bold strategy because he might hate it. <laughs> I said, we should screen it for him. So Universal got in touch with George Romero, who was on holiday in Florida at the time and watched it on his own in a cinema in Florida with a Universal security guard, which I always thought was funny because I thought, well, do you have a security guard like George Romero is going to pirate the movie himself? And even if he did, he would be the one person who would be <laughs> who would uh, be allowed to profit from the movie since it's essentially we're riffing on his ideas. Anyway, later that day, we were both in London, me and Simon. I remember vividly where I was. I was in a little like spare room in, in my flat in uh, Islington and Simon had just heard from him and then he called me. This is before the days of like group Zooms. So I got a call like from the States and it was George Romero calling from Florida. He was like, man, I loved your movie. I had such a blast with it. And it, you know, he couldn't have been nicer about it. And it was sort of, even though the film was incredibly well received by the film community and a lot of my favorite directors, George Romero was the first person to see it. And in a way, that was the only good review that we needed. It's the fact that George Romero, the godfather of the zombie movie, loved Shaun of the Dead and ended up giving us like a poster quote for it. And, you know, I, I remember it as feeling it, feeling that it was the, the moment that the universe started to get a little smaller for me in a very nice way. But again, even though there were great reviews to come and lots of other of my favorite directors who really loved the movie, George Romero's words meant so much to me. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to turn the projects that influenced you into your own language? I think, <clears throat> I think the biggest um, obstacle for me in a way was early on was trying to, um, after I'd made my first film, which I was not particularly kind of happy with, I then started making uh, TV and and in, in a way like because I never went to film school properly making TV I was very lucky to be making TV at a very young age when I was like between the ages of 21 and you know like 26 um, it was sort of really like me going to college you know like I mean 
growing up in public in the sense of like, you know, I had TV shows on, on network TV in the UK, but I was still kind of learning what I was doing. Um, but getting back into film again, I think the sort of the biggest challenge for me was just to kind of try and write because when people ask me what I do, I always say, oh, I'm a, I'm a director. But I never say writer director because it's always like felt like that was uh, writing. Even though I'm very proud of the screenplays that I've done and I've written on every film that I've done and and some films I've written solo like Baby Driver, um, but I never consider myself like a screenwriter. And and, and you know I've written <laughs> I've written on a Spielberg film, <laughs> but it's always something where I think sort of writing was a means to an end initially. I never intended to be a writer, but when I was looking to make another film, I was starting to read some scripts and I just couldn't help thinking, oh, I could do better than this. So it really sort of became, that's how Shaun of the Dead started, is that me and Simon wanted to do something else. And I was like, well, we should write it together. So I think that was the sort of biggest hurdle for me was just like um, the challenge of just writing and writing something that I was proud enough to film. And to be honest, every time I start to write a script, it feels like going back to like square one where every writer feels this, but like when you've got a blank final draft document in front of you, you always feel like a fraud. It's like, ah, oh, well, who am I kidding? I'm not a writer. But then, you know, when it goes, writing is, is, is tough because when it goes like, well, it's the best, but you know, that's kind of like 10% um, of the <laughs> effort expended. So I think the biggest challenge for me is just writing. That to me is like the hardest bit and the bit that takes the longest. What keeps you optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound? I feel optimistic about the industry in terms of, if we can relate it to cinemas, I feel very passionately about the cinematic experience, is that I've watched hundreds of movies at home during the pandemic and I have a nice like home theater setup. I have a nice big screen, but there have been several times when I've been watching films either with my girlfriend and feeling that, oh, wouldn't it be great to be seeing this with an audience? Or there have been times when I've been watching films on my own and you sort of look around to like the sort of the, the empty couch for some kind of like conversation about what you've just seen. I felt that particularly watching, I watched all of the nominees for the BAFTAs and the Oscars this year. And it was um, it was it was great doing that. But it was also sad just not really being able to talk to anybody about anything. And, and also the, the films kind of like were even though some of them were great, they were all like existing in a vacuum, like you were watching them on your own and you didn't know how things were playing. You didn't know how other people felt about it. And, you know, you couldn't talk to anybody in the lobby or you couldn't go for coffee afterwards and talk about something. So here's the thing is I watch hundreds of movies at home, but as soon as cinemas were open again, I was there first night. And also I went to see a movie that I have on Blu-ray at home. I went to see Blowout at the BFI South Bank. And I was also very heartened by the fact that during the, the, only a couple of months ago, Universal re-released Scott Pilgrim in Dolby Cinema. And it had the highest screen average of the week for a film that's on Netflix at the moment. So people actually, made the choice of that they could watch it on their TV or their laptop or their phone even, or their iPad, but they went to the cinema to see it. Or like the other day I introduced a screening of Shaun of the Dead at the cinema to like a, a, a full house of people who've seen it. And I said, has anybody not seen this movie before? Nobody put their hand up. You know, like people had seen it like over 20 times, but they're watching it at the cinema. I like have, some of the films I've seen, like sort of in the kind of the, as theaters start to reopen, whether it be seeing like Tenet um, on IMAX or like I went to see The Good, The Bad, The Ugly and um, Once More Time in the West, like uh, on the big screen and Akira on the big screen. And then like I watched Black Narcissus on the big screen and then new releases like uh, watch A Quiet Place Part 2 with an audience and and that's why we go back is because you want the communal experience and like like I said I have a really nice like home theatre set up but I want to get out of the house and, and cinema to me is, is the experience of watching something in the dark with strangers it's 75% of the experience to me 
Um, and so I don't think it'll ever go away. And I, I, I sort of get mad at just the sort of the, the media conversation always tends to like focus on streamers and I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, I'm going to see it at the cinema if I can. I even, as an example, on Sunday, I had like a, a day free because my, my girlfriend was doing something in the house and said, do you mind making yourself scarce? I said, with pleasure. And I'd already planned it in my head. I think I'm going to go and see a double bill on my own. Like, so, and what did I go and I saw the most unlikely double bill of all time on Sunday. I saw Godzilla versus Kong, followed by Kelly Reichardt's First Cow, which is a double bill of the loudest film and the quietest film together. But interesting to me, I'd had the opportunity to watch Godzilla versus Kong on a screener or uh, on like Apple TV, but I had not done it because I think in, if I watch that film at all, I'm going to watch it at the cinema. The idea of watching Godzilla vs. Kong at home is like alien to me. It's like, why would you do that? Like, so that was what I did on Sunday and I will continue to go and see films at the cinema and I know I'm not alone.